if I can ask a pothead question for a second. So you <laughs> mentioned just like the silkworms, the individualist s s silkworms got uh, to actually learn how to collaborate yes. or yes. actually to collaborate yes. like sw in a swarm-like way. You're talking about getting plants to communicate in some interesting way based on an objective function. Is it possible uh, to have some kind of interface between another kind of organisms, humans, and nature, so like uh, a human to have a conversation with, with a plant. There already is. You know that when we cut, freshly cut grass, I love the smell, mm -hmm. but it's a smell of, actually it's a smell of distress that the leaves of grass are communicating to each other. So the grass, when it's cut, emits green leaf uh, volatiles, GLVs. And those GLVs are basically one leaf of gr grass communicating to another leaf of grass be careful, mind you, you're about to be cut. <laughs> These incredible life forms are communicating using a different language than ours. We use language models, they use molecular models. It, at the moment where we can parse, in, we can, we can um, decode these molecular moments is when we can start having a conversation with plants. Now, of course, there is a lot of work around uh, plant neurobiology. It's a real thing. Uh, plants do not have a um, nervous system but they have something akin to a nervous system. It has a kind of a ecological intelligence that is focused on a particular time scale, and the time scale is very, very slow, 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 slow time scale. So it is when we can melt these time scales and 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 connect with these plants in terms of the content of the language, in this case, molecules, the duration of the language, and we can start having a conversation. If not, simply to understand what is happening in the plant kingdom. Precision agriculture, I promise to you, will look very, very different, right? Because right now we're using drones to take photos of crops of corn that look bad. And when we take that photo, it's already too late. But if we understand these molecular footprints and things that they are trying to say, the stress that they are trying to communicate, then we could, of course, predict the physiological, biological behavior of these crops, both for for their own uh, self-perpetuation, but also for the, the foods and, and, and the pharma and, and the type of molecules that we're seeking to grow for the benefit of humanity. And so these languages um, that we are attempting now to quantify and qualify uh, will really help us not only better nature and help nature in its uh, striving to surviving, but also help us, uh, you know, design better wines and uh you know and and better foods and 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 better medicine and better products again across all scales across all application domains is there intricacies to understanding the time scales like you mentioned at which these communications these languages like operate is there something different between the way humans communicate and the way plants communicate in terms of time remember when we started the conversation talking about sort of definitions in the context of design and then in the context of being, that question requires, I think, a kind of a shift, um, a humility. That requires a, a kind of a humility towards nature, understanding that it operates on different scales. We, we recently discovered that, uh, you know, that the molecular footprint of a rose or of a plant in general during nighttime is different than its molecular footprint during daytime. So these are circadian rhythms that are associated with um, what kind of molecules these plants emit um, given stress, stresses and given, um, you know, there's a reason why uh, why the jasmine, a jasmine field smells so, so delicious and 4 a.m. in the morning. And then there's like, there's, there's peace and rest amongst, you know, amongst the plants. And you have to sort of tune into that time dimension of, of the plant kingdom. And that, of course, requires all this humility where in a single capsule to design a biodiversity chamber, it w will take years not months and definitely not days and to see these products. And also that humility in design comes from simply, you know, looking at how we are today as a civilization, how we use and abuse nature. Like just think of all these Christmas trees, right? These Christmas trees, they take years to grow. We use them for one night, the holiest night of the year. And then we let them go and think about in nature to design a quote unquote product 
an organism spends energy and time and thoughtfulness and many, many, many years, and I'm thinking about the redwoods, um, to grow these channels, these, you know, the cellulose layers and channels and reach these incredible heights takes sometimes hundreds of years, sometimes thousands of years. Am I afraid of building a company that designs products in the scale of thousands of years? No, I'm not. And the way of being in the physical world today it is really not in tune with the time dimension of the natural world at all. And, um, and, and that needs to change. And that's obviously very, very hard to do in a, a community in a, of, of, of human beings that is, at least in the Western world, that is based on capitalism. And so mm-hmm. here, the wonderful challenge that we have ahead of us is how do we impart upon the capitalist movement. We know that we need to produce now products that will enter the real world and be, you know, shared and used by others uh, and still benefit the natural world while benefiting humans. And that's a wonderful challenge to have. So integrate technology with nature, and that's a really difficult problem. I see parallels here with another company of Neuralink, which is uh, is basically like you, I think you mentioned Neuralink for nature. Um, that there are short-term products you can come up with, but it's ultimately a long-term challenge of how do you integrate the machine with this creation of nature, this intricate, complex creation of nature, which is the human brain, and then you're speaking more generally, nature. You know how every company has an image, like this one single image that embodies the spirit of the company. Mm -hmm. And I think for Neuralink, it was, to me, that chimpanzee playing a video game. Mm -hmm. It was just unbelievable. But with plants, there potentially is a set of molecules that um, impacts or inspires, I like that word, the plant to um, behave or act in a certain way. Um, and allows still the plant the possibility of deciding where it or she or he wants to go, uh, which is why our, our first product for this molecular space is going to be a functionalized fragrance. So here uh, we're thinking about the future of fragrances and the future of fragrances and flavors. Um, you know, these these products are in the industry as we know it today are designed for totally for a human centric uh, use and um and enjoyment and indulgence and luxury um they're used on the body for the sake of I don't know attraction and and feeling good um and smelling good and we were asking ourselves is there a world in which um in which a Fragrance can be not a functional fragrance, because you could claim that all fragrances are functional, but is there a world in which the fu- the fragrance becomes functionalized, is again I- imparted upon or given agency to connect with another organism? Is there a world in which um, you and I can go down to your garden and use a perfume that will interact with the rose garden downstairs? Um, I've just been enamored with the statements that are being made in the media around, oh, this is completely biologically derived fragrance and it's bio-based. And, but when you look into the fragrance and you understand that in order to get to this bio-derived fragrance, you went through, you blew through, uh, you know, 10,000, 10,000 bushes of rose to create five milliliters of, of a rose fragrance. And all these 10,000 bushes of rose, they take space, they take, you know, water management and, and so much waste. Um, is this really what we want the future of our agriculture and molecular goods to look like? And so when we did the Aguahoja Pavilion on the roof of SF MoMA, we calculated that for that pavilion, we had 40,000 calories embedded into this pavilion that was made of shrimp shells and chitosan and, mm-hmm. and um, apple skins and, and cellulose from tree, uh, tree pulp. And we calculated that overall the structure had 40,000 calories. Interesting way to think about a structure, right? Mm-hmm. From, the, from the point of view of, of calories. But as you left the gallery, you saw these three clocks that were so beautifully designed by Felix on our team. And these clocks measured uh, temperature and humidity and we connected them to a weather channel so that we could directly um, 
look at how the pavilion was biodegrading in real time. And, mm-hmm. and, and in our calculations, I say this long-winded uh, description of the pavilion to say that in the calculation, we incorporated um, you know, how much electricity we used for our computers, for the 3D printers that printed the pavilion. And, you know, and these were called energy calculations, right? Energy and materials. Mm-hmm. And when you think about a product and you think about you know, a shoe or a chair or a perfume or a building, you don't stop at the object. You want to go all the way to the system. Again, instead of designing objects or singular embodiments of a the, the will of the designer, you're really tapping into an entire system that is interconnected. And if you look at the energy budget that characterized the Project Agoja, it traverses the entire planet, right? Some of these shrimp shells were brought from places in the world we haven't thought of in terms of the apples and, and the shrimp shells and the tree pulp. And so going back to, you know, going back to to fragrances, um, it, it's really, really important to understand the product in the context of the ecological system from which it's sourced and and how it's designed. And that is the kind of thinking um, that is not only desired, but is required if we are to achieve synergy between humanity and nature. And it's interesting because the system level thinking is almost always going to take you to the entire earth, to considering the entire earth ecosystem. Which is why it's important to have a left brain and a right brain competing for attention. (laughs) And intimacy, I mean. Yes. (laughs) Uh, you, you mentioned a fragrance that kind of sends out a message to the environment, essentially. A message in a bottle, yeah. A message in a bottle. So like, so you can go to a rose garden and trick the rose garden to think it's 4 a.m., essentially. You could if you wanted to, but maybe that is... Not trick. Tr- trick is such right. a bad word. Right, Inspire. But in- <laughs> inspire, I like. I, I like the idea of providing nature with a choice, which is why I love that elegant mathematical equation of empowerment and agency. Empower the, uh, the, the Rose Garden to, uh, to create a romantic moment for the, uh, for the wearer of the fragrance. But now okay. again, you're, you're, again, all of this to go back to, back to that human-centric notion of romance. But maybe there's another way to do romance, right? That, that we haven't yet, you know, that we haven't yet explored. And, and maybe... You know, there is a way to tap into what happens to the rose when it's dreaming. Assuming that plants are sentient and assuming that we can tap into that sentience, what can we discover about what, what does the rose want? Like, what, is, what does it actually want? And, and, and what does it need? And what are, what, what are the rose's, um, you know, dreams? But do you think there's some correlation in terms of romance, in terms of the word you sometimes use, magic? Is there some similarities in what humans want and what roses want and what nature wants? I think so. I think there is. And if I did not think so, oh my goodness, this is, would not be a nice world to live in. I think we all want love. <laughs> I recently read this beautiful letter that was written by Einstein to his daughter mm-hmm. um, and was discovered Einstein asked his daughter to wait 20 years until she reveals these letters, and so she did. It's just one of the most beautiful letters I've ever read from a father to his daughter. And the letter overall is imbued with a kind of a a sense of remorse or maybe even feelings of sadness. And there is some kind of melancholy note in the letter uh, where Einstein regrets not having spent enough time with his daughter, uh, having focused on, you know, the theory of general relativity and changing the world. And then he goes on to talk about this beautiful and elegant equation of E equals MC square. And he tells his daughter that he believes that love is actually the force that shapes the universe because it is like gravity, right? It attracts people. It is like light. It brings people together and connect, connects between people. Um, and it's all empowering. And, and so if you multiply it by the, the speed of light, you could really uh, change the world for the better. And I, I call me a romanticist. I know you are too, mm-hmm. um, which is why I so love being here. I, I believe in this. I I totally and utterly um, believe 
in 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 love. love. But let me just excerpt from Einstein's letter. There's an extremely powerful force that so far science has not found a formal explanation to. It is a force that includes and governs all others and is even behind any phenomena operating in the universe and has not yet been identified by us. This universal force is love. He also, the last paragraph in the letter, as you've mentioned, I deeply regret not having been able to express what is in my heart, which has quietly beaten for you all my life. Maybe it's too late to apologize, but as time is relative, <laughs> that jokes to Einstein, I need to tell you that I love you. And uh, thanks to you, I have reached the ultimate answer. Your father, Albert Einstein. Yeah. But that regret, I deeply regret not having been able to express what is in my heart. Maybe that's a universal regret. Filling your days with busyness yeah. and silly pursuits and not sitting down and uh, expressing that. But it is everything. It is everything. It is why I love that expression. And I forget who said this, but I, I love my daughter more than um, evolution required, right? And um, I feel the same way towards my other half. And, and I feel that when you find that connection, um, everything and anything is possible. Um, and it's a, a very, very, very magical, um, a magical moment. So I, I, I believe in love and I believe in the one. <laughs>